Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 12, says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully with tears. I'm going to preach this morning on the subject of missed opportunities. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today. I thank you for your word and I thank you for your people. Lord, that are here assembled in this service this morning. Lord, I pray that this morning that we would not come with enticing words of men's wisdom, but Lord, with power and demonstration. And Father, I pray that you would anoint me from on high and you would allow me to be able to speak what you have placed in my heart for us this morning. And Father, I just pray today that let them that have an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And Lord, I give you all the praise and the glory. Lord, I just pray that your Spirit would be present here today that would just encourage us and lift us up and give us the tools and equip us to be able to get to the next level and finally reach our destination, our predestined and divine purpose that you have placed in our lives. And Father, I thank you for it and I praise you and I give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen. Uh, I want to talk for just a little bit this morning about missed opportunities. And I'm not talking about opportunities that somebody stole from you or opportunities that some that you missed because somebody beat you out of them or, or because you know, they pried them out of your hands. But I want to talk about opportunities that sometimes we miss just by not placing value on them. Somebody say amen. Uh, opportunities that we miss just simply because we don't value them the way that God values them. That we don't put the, uh, the, uh, the effort into them that we should so that, that it can be able to reach that destiny. Um, you know, I'm talking about the things that God wants to give you. Many people that they, they don't place value on their ministry. They don't place value on their salvation. Many times God puts giftings and abilities in people and they don't place value on it. Listen, uh, sometimes God puts giftings and abilities and ministries and, and all types of things in our path. And if we're not careful, we won't value those things the way that God values them. Huh? And we'll put other things and make them of a higher esteem than the giftings and the abilities that God puts in us. And it begins to talk about Esau. Esau was the man that had something from God and giftings and blessings that was going to be flowing into his life. But yet, because he did not place value on it, he missed it and he lost it. And we find out through the scriptures that after he lost it, he went back and tried to get it back and tried tried to repent and tried to get things together, but it had been too late. He had already been rejected. Now, think about this for a moment. We have read through the Bible. We've, we've all heard it. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Have we not heard that? But do you know that it was really destined to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau? Because he was the firstborn. He had the birthright. It was his to lose. Oh, is there anybody here today? Huh? Huh? It was his to lose. He had it. He had it in his hands. It was his birthright, which means it was certain rights that were afforded and given to him because of his birth. Huh? He was just born to succeed. 
Oh, come on, somebody. Shout with me this morning. He was born to succeed. He was born for victory. He was created to be uh, victorious. He was created to have, he had a predestined, predesigned purpose in his life. God allowed him to be born first, which gave him the blessings and the birthright. And it should have been the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Come on, somebody. Huh? But because he did not value what God had placed in his life, come on, somebody. We have read it throughout the centuries. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You say, why would Esau ever have lost a birthright like that? Why would Esau have gave up the blessing of God that he to walk in? He was born to live in. And I've heard some people say, well, Jacob tricked him. Huh? You can't trick somebody that knows the value of stuff. Amen. Amen. If I was, me and Jay were going fishing, which we usually do, and he don't catch very much. (laughs) And and Jay just got a truck, and I had a new fishing pole. And I told Jay, Jay, I really like this truck. And you really like this fishing pole. Because my fishing pole's catching all the fish and yours isn't catching any. Would you be willing to trade me this fishing pole for your truck? If Jay did it, <laughs> would you say that I tricked him or would you just say he was dumb? <laughs> huh? To me, that's really not much of a trick. That's just that he did not place the value on his truck. Somebody say amen. And we have said for years that Jacob tricked Esau, but the truth of it is you can't trick somebody that values something. Now see, the most of the time we talk about value, we talk about what it appraises for, but really it's only worth what somebody will give for it. Huh? And things that cannot be of great value to other people can be of great value to us. You can have a gun that's really not worth anything, an old Sears and Roebuck single shot shotgun that's all messed up and got t- tarnish on the barrel and the stock doesn't look good. And to most people, they wouldn't give you $50 for it. But if that was your great grandfather's gun that was passed down to the grandfather and passed down to your father and passed down to you, you would not take the greatest gun in the world of the most value because to you you own it. Is anybody here today? And see I find out that there's many people that the things that God has deposited in their lives and he's put great value on it. Callings, gifting, ministries but yet they don't find great value in it and they sometimes are, are, are destined to be rejected and destined to lose those things that God places great value on in their lives. Are you in this place with me today? Uh, the reason that Esau lost his birthright was not because he was uh, tricked. It was because he did not place any value in it. Amen. It was because he didn't think it was worth anything. It was because he valued a temporary hunger in his own flesh was greater than a birthright that would have caused a permanent blessing to take place in his life. And he missed an opportunity of a lifetime that rather than be called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, it changed destiny and became the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the promises of God and all the blessings of God and the lineage that would have flowed down in his life was aborted because he did not place value on it. Are you in this place with me today? And many times uh, we miss our opportunities. Many times people, we, they, they, uh, uh, it seems as though people are stealing our opportunities. It seems as though that people are taking our opportunities. But the truth is you can't be tricked out of something that you place value in. You can't be tricked out of something that you call important in your life because it's the value that you place upon it. 
And there's many missed opportunities I could take you down throughout the years and take you down through people in their lives that missed opportunities that God wanted to do great things in their life, but they missed the opportunity. God wanted to bless them, but they missed the opportunity. God wanted to raise them up, but they missed the opportunity. God put callings in their life and destinies and purposes in their life, but because they did not value it or the value that they placed on other things was more important than what God placed in their lives. They never received it. They never walked in the fruition of it. And I believe that God gave me this message for somebody in here today that God has placed things in your life. He's placed callings. He's placed abilities. But if you're not careful, you're going to miss the opportunity that God's put in your life because you value everything else and place little value on what God's given you. Uh, uh. I want to talk just here a few moments on this text and then I'm going to let you go home but I want to talk about some of the things that we value that will cause us to miss our opportunities. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down in the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed. That's King James version of way of saying huh? don't let what's hurting you get you off course. He said, strengthen the feeble knees. Lift up those hands. He said, make the path straight for your feet, lest whatever's lame in your life will get you off track. Uh, get you off the path. He said, but rather, let it be healed in your life. Uh, and listen, I just, whenever I was reading that, something just went out of my spirit. You know how many people have missed opportunities because of hurts in their life? Because of pain in their life? Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Huh? Because of hurt and because of pain, many people have missed their opportunities. Many people have allowed things that have damaged them and made them lame and made them hurt. Have the opportunities that God has placed in their life and they have forfeited what God has called them to do because they've been hurt. Oh, come on, somebody. You've got to be careful when you're making decisions while you're hurt because whenever you make decisions after being hurt, it's usually the wrong decision. I have, I have tried to make it a, a, a goal in my life not to make decisions while I'm upset or not to make decisions while I'm hurt, decisions while I'm discouraged. Come on, because that's when you make the wrong decisions. I, I, I usually, if I'm upset, I don't talk to people because usually when you talk to people and you're upset, you'll say, the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. I try to keep a calm, collected mind. I try to get my thoughts together and get myself under control before I step out in any situation. Why? Because I realize that if I'm not careful, I could allow the hurt that's in my life to abort the promises of God. If we're not careful, huh, we can allow things that hurt us to make us abort our promises with God. Do you know how many people have missed the promises of God because they got hurt? Come on. Uh, God, listen, here's one thing I want you to understand. Esau was destined for greatness. It was his. The birthright was his. He was born for it. It was his destiny, but he missed it. Huh? I'll let you know there are things in your life that God has called you for and destined you for that are yours for the losing. But if you're not careful, you can allow hurt in your life to abort what's already yours. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody. You can allow things that have hurt you, people that have hurt you, pastors that have hurt you, family members that have hurt you, spouses that have hurt you, somebody that goes to church that has hurt you, and you can make a decision while you're hurt and a decision while you're discouraged, and it can abort the entire plan of God that's in your life. Is anybody here? Now listen, I got to encourage somebody. I don't care how bad it hurts. I don't care how bad the pain is. I want to encourage you to wipe your tears up and lift your lift up and wash your face and comb your hair and stand up and say God is more than enough in my life to get me to the next level. God's more than enough to get me from where I am to where I'm going to be. See, sometimes you got to realize it doesn't matter how bad it hurts that the promises of God are before you. Oh, see, listen, if you're not careful, 
Uh, see, some people, they want to work for God, but they're thin-skinned. You can't work for God and be thin-skinned. If you get hurt easy, you might want to take up gardening. Or you might want to start paint, uh, planting daisies or start a greenhouse or start sewing or knitting or something like that. But you're not, there ain't no sense in start working for God if you can get hurt easily. Oh, come on, somebody. Because, listen, the devil knows that he could, if he can get you hurt, here's what it said. It said that there's a path, there's a destiny that God has called you for that you can show up where God wants you to be. He said if you're not careful, the things in your life that have become hurt and lame will cause you to get off course. They'll cause you to get off track. They'll cause you to be down roads that you ought not be in and doing things. How many people have missed God's best for them because they've been hurt? How many people have got a divorce that they wish they wouldn't have got because they got hurt? How many people have left a church that they wish they wouldn't have left because they got hurt? How many people have made decisions and broken relationships or quit jobs or, or, or pushed people away that they really didn't want to, but it was a moment of hurt in their life? Life. And so they made decisions off of a temporary hurt that would impact the rest of their life. I got to tell somebody, it doesn't matter how bad it hurts. You got to keep pressing forward towards the mark of the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. You got to shake off every weight and sin which does so easily beset you. And you got to press on and fight on because the thing that's before you is greater than the thing that you're fighting against right now. How many say amen? Huh? The first thing that'll stop you from reaching and make you miss an opportunity is hurt. There's a lot of people that have been hurt. Uh, some of the greatest ministries probably that this world has ever seen have never come to fruition because somebody got hurt and quit. Somebody got hurt and gave up. Somebody got hurt and made a bad decision. Somebody got hurt and made a divorce. Somebody got hurt and left. Is this microphone on? Uh, he says, be careful for the things that hurt you. Because he said, they will cause you to be turned out of the way. But then I like this part. He says, but let it rather be healed. That sounds like a funny thing. To where you would say... For somebody to let it be healed. You would think that they would want it to be healed. You would think that they'd be like, man, I'm hurt. I want to be healed. But not everybody does. Huh. Isn't it a funny thing that Jesus said to the crippled man, will you be made whole? Huh? Will you be made whole? Will you be healed? Will you let it heal? I found out. Now, I'm not real old. I am getting a couple gray hairs in my beard. And the more that I let it grow out, the more that I'm finding. Huh? And is there more to come? I heard that there's more to come. Huh? But listen, I have found out that there are some people that just won't let it be healed. There are some people that enjoy the pity. Oh, come on, somebody. There's some people that enjoy the attention that pain brings, that enjoy the attention. They, they wouldn't have anything else to talk about if they weren't talking about all the people that hurt them and done them wrong and talked about them. And this microphone clicked off on me again, Ben. Turn it on. Uh, they, they, they wouldn't know. Uh, they wouldn't have anything to talk about. They wouldn't have anything to function. They, their life would be incomplete. And listen, if you want to be able to go to where God's destined you to be and not miss an opportunity, you just got to let that thing heal in your life. You just got the only way to let it heal is to step back away from it and let God do something in your life. I remember I've got a scar right here on my hand from a long time ago. And... Uh, you know why that scar is there? Because there was a scab there that I just wouldn't let heal. And I can remember uh, my mom would say, quit picking. 
Some of y'all must have done the same thing. Quit picking at that thing and let it heal. Because if you keep picking at it, ain't nobody going to preach with me this morning. If you keep picking at it, that thing will never heal. Oh, is anybody here today? And I believe there's a lot of people, maybe some that I'm talking to today, that are missing their opportunities because they keep picking at stuff that God's trying to heal in their life. Uh, there's some things that God's trying to do in you uh, that you just won't let him do. Uh, there's some things that every time God tries to heal that thing and mend that thing and put the healing balm on so it can be healed in your life, you've got to always bring it back up again uh, and you've got to always pick at it uh, and you've always got to work at it uh, and stir it. But listen, you're missing your opportunity uh, all the time uh, that you're allowing that thing to fester in your life. You are missing your opportunity. You are missing what God wants to do in your life. He said, listen, don't let those things that are lame in your life stop you from reaching your destiny. He said, really, just let it heal. Uh, look at somebody beside you real quick and tell them, let it heal. Uh, let it heal. Huh? Sometimes it is painful. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes we get thorns in there. Sometimes we get discouragement in there. Sometimes we get all kinds of problems. But if you'll just let that thing alone, watch, let God heal it. Let him heal it in your life. You can't be healed of something that you're holding on to. Oh, somebody say amen. I said you can't be healed of something that you're holding on to. You can't be healed of something that you're thinking about all the time. You can't be healed of something that you always keep bringing up and you'll never let forgiveness come. And things start to fester in your life and you won't forgive it. You won't forget and you won't put it under the blood and you shout about it and you pray about it. But every time God tries to heal it, you bring it back up again. You're missing your opportunity for God to do something great in your life. The best thing you could do is let him heal it. Let go of it. Let God get that thing out of your life so healing can take place so you can go to the next dimension in your faith. Uh, look here what he said. Uh, first thing that will stop you to miss your opportunity is hurt. You got to let that hurt be healed. The next thing you got to understand is in verse 14. He said... Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. The second thing that will make you miss your opportunity is you'll be trying to please the wrong people. Now see, God didn't call you to be, uh, the scripture was up there, God didn't call you to be people pleasers. He called you to have peace with them. Right? And see, here's another thing. If you get hurt easily, you'll never reach your destiny. And if you are a people pleaser, you will never reach your destiny. You know why? Because you can never please people all the time. How many say amen? Oh, is there anybody here today? You know that people caused Moses to miss the promised land? It wasn't, huh? It was Moses that had brought them out of Egypt. But when it came time to go into the promised land, God said, you can't go in. Why? Because the people made you so mad, Moses, you didn't know how to deal with them, and you broke the covenant. Somebody say amen. If you're not careful, people will drive you crazy. Uh, do I have anybody in this house? People will drive you crazy. If you're not careful, people will keep you from reaching the promise of God in your life. If you sit around worrying about what everybody else thinks about you, and if everybody else thinks you're a good preacher, and if everybody else thinks you got it, and if everybody else thinks you're anointed, you'll never go any farther than you are. The Bible doesn't say that you have to be a people pleaser. It just says you have to have peace with all men. Let me let you in on a secret. Some people bring peace by coming. Other people bring peace by going. 
Oh, don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. Huh? And the key to being in peace is finding out which ones ought to be coming and which ones ought to be going in your life. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about friends and family members. I'm talking about people that you associate with. Some people, they stir up trouble in hell every time you're around them. Those, you're not walking in peace. Every time you're around them, you're walking in torment. Every time they call you in the phone, they bring you down. They're the kind of people that you don't even like to pick up the phone. When you pick up the phone, you're like, hello. I'm not going to be able to talk very long because I'm losing you. If you got something to say, just say it real quick or text me because I'm not going to be able to get you very long. <laughs> Has, have I ever done that to any of you when you called me? If I did, I have just let you in on my little secret. Huh? Some people, they don't bring peace by coming around. Some people, their whole purpose in life is to aggravate you. And the devil will put those people in your life to keep you from your promises. Somebody say amen. Not everybody that was in, is in your life has been put there to get you to God's purpose. Because listen, the same way God puts people in your life to bless you, the devil will put people in your life to stop you from reaching and you'll miss your opportunity because you're sitting around trying to make peace with people that you can't make peace with. You're trying to please people that are unpleasable. You're trying to do things in your life. Come on, I wish I had half a church in here. Uh, you're trying to do things and you're stressing yourself out, trying to please people that cannot be pleased. God didn't say you had to please them. He just said have peace with them. And some people, you can have a lot better peace with them when you just wave at them when you go by. That's the most peaceful you'll ever be is when you're like, God bless you. Now, there are some people that God will bring in your life that they're a peace to be around. Huh? God will put people in your life. Those are the people you want to surround yourself with. That is the key to having peace with all men. Surrounding yourself with people that bring peace and distancing yourself from people that bring non-peace. Are you with me? Oh, man, y'all got quiet for me. Huh. Listen, he said to have peace with all men. See, if you're not careful, people will cause you to miss your opportunities with God. People will cause you to miss your opportunities with God. I found out life's too short to sit around and fight about it. Life's too short to be aggravated. How many say amen? I said life is too short to be aggravated. Why sit around and be constantly aggravated with something that can never be fixed because there, come on somebody, that is the key to having peace with all men is finding out who you can be around and keep the peace. Somebody say amen. Then it goes on to say holiness. Now, all, now that we find out that God didn't call you to be people pleasers, he did call you to be God pleasers. And there are some people that the reason they've missed their opportunity is because of people. There's other people that have missed their opportunities because they fail to please God. The Bible says to walk in holiness without, without which no man shall see God. Huh? Listen, I want you to know, if you don't walk holy before God, you'll never see God. Huh? Not only will you not see him on the other side, but you'll not see him in your life right now. You'll not see his will in your life. You'll not see his destiny in your life. You'll not see his purposes in your life. You'll not see his blessings in your life. Without holiness, you will never see God. But I'll let you know, when you walk in holiness, it does something to your spiritual vision that you start to see God dropping blessings and handfuls on purpose. And you see God start opening up doors for you that you never thought could be opened before. And you see God starting to give you a harvest that you never think that you could have before. Why? Because you're walking in holiness. And when you're walking holy, you can see God. The Bible says it hath not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know we shall be like him. For when we 
see him, uh, come on somebody, we shall be like him. The more that we see him, the more that we will be like him. The more that we walk uh, in holiness, uh, the more that we see him. Uh, somebody say amen. Many people have missed their opportunities because they're people pleasers. Other people have missed their opportunity because they spend so much time trying to please people that they can't please God. And in most cases, it's impossible to please God and people at the same time. Have I lost you yet? Still with me? Huh? So, so far, what causes us to miss our opportunities with God sometimes hurt will. Some people miss their opportunities with God because they've been hurt. Some people miss their opportunities with God because of people. They're people pleasers. They run from person to person trying to get them to nod, pat them on the back, and give them an attaboy. And you got to be careful with that because when people are done with you, they chew you up and spit you out. Uh, Rather than be people pleasers, you need to try to have peace with people and begin to please God, which is holiness. All right? The next verse, verse 15, it says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up in you trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Not only will hurt stop you from your destiny, and not only will sometimes people keep you from your destiny if you let them, but sometimes bitterness will keep you from your destiny. Oh, man, you all got quiet again. One of the hardest things to do as a Christian trying to fulfill your purpose with God is to be able to go through fiery trials, not be bitter when you come out of the other side. Because it is easy to focus your attention on a person when you're going through trials and start to blame them for your trials and start to blame them for hurt. Oh, is anybody here today? And what that's called is bitterness. And now you can't even sit in the same room with them. Is this microphone on? Because I feel like I keep lost you again. Now you can't sit on the mic, you can't sit in the same church with them anymore. You can't even drive by them without giving them a dirty look out the window. You see them sitting in church, one to be sitting over on this side, one to be sitting over on that side, and the whole time you're preaching, they're just looking at each other going. The preacher says something, they're like, yeah, you need it. (laughs) Then you say something else, and they're like, no, you need it. Uh, You can't even stand to hear somebody mention their name. Oh, that's good preaching. Somebody mentions their name. There's some kind of snide remark comes out of you. Bitterness will keep you and cause you to miss your opportunities that God has in your life. Because, listen, let me just let you on a little secret. If you go through the test and you come out bitter, you failed. Huh? If you are going through a test right now and you come out on the other side of it bitter, you just failed the test. You want me to tell you how you win the test? You win it like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They went through the fire. But when they come out, they didn't have any bonds on them. And they didn't even have the smell of smoke in their life. Come on, somebody. My God, what good would you do to come out of a test and be angry and hateful and bitter and full of hatred? Because Come on, somebody. You didn't pass the test because, see, tests will either make you bitter or they'll make you better. 
Huh? Sometimes you go through the test huh? and you come out bitter and, and you've got a hatred and, and you've got anger and, and you're focusing all your uh, evil uh, thoughts on people. But there's other people that come out of the test huh? and they got some prayer because they've been spending time on their knees huh? and they got a new love huh? and they got a newfound uh, anointing huh? and a new revelation. Why? Because rather than get bitter, they got better huh? and they decided, I'm not going to allow this test that I'm going through to stop me from my opportunity. I'm not going to allow it to keep me from getting to the next level that God's called me to. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to let bitterness set up in my life. And it's, I'll be honest with you, it's hard to do. I'll be honest with you, I got to just be transparent. I got to pray all the time. God, don't let bitterness get in my heart. Uh, uh, don't let anger get in my heart. Uh, do any of you have to do that? Uh, somebody talks about you, talks about your kids, talks about your mean wife, which a lot of that's true. There she is. Now, see, you can't argue with stuff that's true. It's the lies you got to watch out for. But if you're not careful, you can allow testing that you're going through to cause you to get bitter. Sometimes you can get bitter just by getting older. You can. You can get bitter just by, you get bitter towards people uh, just because so many other people have let you down. Now, as soon as anybody comes around, you just assume they're going to be like everybody else. Are you with me? And bitterness can set in. And you can miss an opportunity that God is trying to do in your life because you allow bitterness. Uh, bitterness, the Bible goes on to describe it. Called it a root of bitterness. Oh, man. Bitterness, man, can get nasty. Uh, it can set up a root in your life. And anybody knows, have you ever had some kind of weed in your flower bed that you just could not get out? And it didn't matter how many times you cut it down, how many times you sprayed it with stuff, how many times you did anything with it, it would not die. You know why? Because the root's still there. You sprayed it with stuff. You dug it. You reached down. There. I'm going to tell you what gets in mind. Those little pointy, uh, thorny things. And you reach down and grab a hold of one of them. Man, it's almost enough to make a preacher cuss. <laughs> but he doesn't. <laughs> but it's almost enough to make him do it. So what he does is say, Mikey, get them things out of there. <laughs> Go get you a glove. We roll around there. But if you don't get the root out, that thing will always come back. And bitterness, the Bible says, has got a root. That you might try to cover, cut it off at the surface. And you might try to make yourself like them. <laughs> and you might try to make yourself to where you can handle, be able to ride by them. But if you don't get the root out, It'll be back. And I'm going to tell you what bitterness will do. It'll cause you to miss your opportunity with God. It'll cause you to miss the blessing that God wants to do in your life. Oh, are you anybody in here? And it says that bitterness springing up will trouble you and it will defile many. Are you with me? I'm not going to be able to preach about all that. I'm going to get to Esau. Started with Esau and we'll finish with him. It says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. And he found no place of repentance, 
though he sought it carefully with tears. First thing I want you to look at is what they're talking about. Fornication, profane, profane person. That's where we get our words profanity. It means dirty. He's uh, talking about sins of the flesh. Keeping your flesh under control. Fornication, sin of the flesh. Profanities, sins of the flesh. Uh, it's a... Uh, Esau, like I said, has become the epitome and he has become the sign of a guy that could not control his flesh. See, the thing with the flesh is, is all of its desires. The Bible says, while we look not at things which are seen, we look at things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal or carnal. The things which are not seen are spiritual or eternal. So he says, fleshly things are temporary things. And what happens is if we're not careful, we will allow our flesh, our temporary fleshly desires to cause us to miss permanent eternal blessings. Self-control. I have seen more people abort the promises of God in their lives over temporary fleshly desires that they could not put under control come on somebody and abort the promises of God in their life I think more than probably anything how many people have aborted the promises of God in their lives because they could not put their desires under control Come on, somebody. Fleshly desires. It's, it has to do with eating and has to do with sex and it has to do with uh, uh, fame and money and uh, pr- pursuing things that make your flesh feel good. Oh, is anybody in this house with me today? Huh? And the Bible says that Esau, because he was hungry, sold out what he was born to be. Sold out his birthright. Sold out the rights that were afforded him because he was hungry. Listen, I'll let you know something today. If you're not careful, the desires that you feel right now, that they can stir up in your life and feel so big that they feel like you have to have that right now. That's the most important thing in your life. If you don't get it right now, that you're going to die. I've been that hungry before, but I've never died. And you can see I'm doing all right in the eating department. But have you ever just been so hungry? But if you're not careful, you will let those temporary, listen, you'll let those temporary feelings and desires cause you to miss an opportunity. We get those desires about everything. Money's a big one here in the United States and I'm sure everywhere else. We get this desire that we got to have more of it. And I just if I had more money, I'd be happy. And if I had more money, I'd be happy. Gary's got all the money of anybody I know. And I, what are you going to do? And he could tell you that money don't make you happy. Huh? But isn't it something how for some reason our flesh gets in this thing like if I just had a lot of money, I'd be happy. Huh? If I just had, you know, more money, I would be happy. All the root of my unhappiness is stemmed from not having enough money. Huh? We, we build this picture in our mind huh? where if I just had more money, so I wasn't behind on the electric bill and I wasn't behind on the water bill and I, and I, and I had more money for Christmas, I would be happy. No, you wouldn't. Uh, the reason I can tell you that is because I've seen a lot of rich people that could not even thought that it was worth living. 
I've seen a lot of rich people that are some of the most miserable people you've ever seen. Have you ever watched Ebenezer Scrooge? Huh? He had all the money, but he was the most miserable person in the world. Let me say amen. Huh? But we get that desire. We get that desire to just eat ourselves to death. I do. Like, man, if I just had another piece of pie, I'd be happy. If I just had this, if I just had another box of Twinkies. If I just had one of those, you ever just been sitting out in the, in the, at the gas pump at the gas station and something goes off in your mind like, if I had one of those double cream stuffed oatmeal pies. Or, or you'll tell, I'll, I'll tell my wife to go in and get me something, and I just know I want something, I don't even know what it is. And I'll be like, just surprise me. I just know I want something. Huh? But listen, if she would ever surprise me with a bag of celery, I'd probably never ask her to do it again. <laughs> surprise. Here's a bag of celery. But you know what it is? It's those desires in our heart. Huh? It's those desires that just say, I got to have it. I need something now. I, I need it. If I, if I had this, I would feel better. If I had that, I would be happy. Huh? It works in every different area of our life. Huh? If I had this, I'd be happy. If I didn't have this wife I have, I'd be happy. Huh? If I didn't have this husband, I'd be happy. If I didn't have this, if I didn't have that, if I could get this, it's all desires. And the truth of it is, none of it will make you happy, but I'm telling you what it will do. It will cause you to miss your opportunities with God. Huh? It will cause you to miss your opportunities with God. You and I have got to get this flesh under control. And we've all struggled with it. They struggle with it throughout the Bible. Look at David, how he struggled with his flesh. Look at Paul. Paul said that there was a thorn constantly in his flesh, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. Then he said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this flesh? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? They were struggling with their fleshly desires. But I'll let you know, you cannot get what God wants for you until you can put those things under subjection. And it will abort the promises of God in your life. Huh? Any desires for these things, the desires for money, the desires for sex, the desires for food, the desires for fame, the desires for wealth, all these things, they'll never get you to where you need to be with God. They will pull you away from the promises of God. And listen, if we're not careful, we will abort the promises of God in our life like Esau did. He sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. A temporary fleshly desire costed him what he was born to be. Some people have sold out what they were born to be for extra paycheck. Some people have sold out what they were born to be for a 34, 24, what's the numbers? Help me out. What is it? 36, 20, 36, that's getting better. 36, 24, 34. 36. I don't know. I'm trying to get off my mind, Lowell. I'm trying. I'm trying. I got him. Well, at least I got you paying attention. Hallelujah. Praise God. Huh? huh? Those things will cause us to miss the mark. You know how many people have sold out and aborted what they were born to be because they couldn't keep their flesh desires under control? How many say amen? Huh? That's what it's all about. Listen, here's, this is the things. And look here, this last scripture. But look here what he said. He said, for you know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing. Now, I want to stop here for a moment. It says he would have inherited the blessing. 
he would have inherited the blessing. He would have inherited the blessing. It would have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But instead of inheriting the blessing, he was rejected. Because he sold out his birthright. But look here what it says. It said, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. That has been the phrase that has brought much debate over repentance. We don't have time to talk about that right now, but if we want to debate it someday over lunch, I'll let you buy. But look here what he said. There's two things that I get out of this. First of all, there are some opportunities that once you miss them, you don't get another shot at them. Doesn't matter how much you cry. Doesn't matter how much you repent. Doesn't matter how much you fall to the altar and how much oil gets dumped on your head. I thank God for opportunities that I've missed that maybe God's given me another chance. But there's all of us that are sitting around saying, man, I've missed some opportunity. I have missed some opportunities. There are some opportunities. That's why you have to be careful and make the most out of every opportunity God gives you. Because Esau never got a chance to go back and fix his mistake. Huh. The second thing you can draw from that is repentance takes more than tears. It says that he sought repentance with tears, carefully with tears. Sometimes, isn't it something how some people, now me, I don't cry very much. I, I cry very little. But if I ever do get crying, I'm mad. But some people, they can turn them on like water fountains. My kids are professionals. I mean, they should get Emmy nominated. I want to nominate them for the Emmys every year. They can turn tears on in a minute. Huh? But you know what? With repentance, huh? it takes more than just tears. It takes a change of heart. It takes a turning. It takes a decision. Huh? And if we're not careful, sometimes we'll miss the opportunities that God has laid in front of us because it's just an emotional thing. It's just tears. It's just tears because maybe we got caught. It's just tears because maybe we feel bad at the time. But repentance requires a turning. Repentance requires a decision. And if we're not careful, sometimes we will miss our opportunities that sometimes we'll never get another chance at. We'll miss opportunities in our life. Listen, if God is giving you an opportunity right now to do something in the kingdom, place some value on it. Say it's more important than, than the next dollar I get. It's more important than having to be here and having to be there. It's more important than going here or doing this. It's more, more important than my desires. It's more important than the hurt that I've felt or the pain that I've felt. This, this opportunity is more important than the bitterness that I'm holding that's going to keep me from it. And sometimes you have to make a decision and say, God, not only is there tears of emotion, but I'm making a decision to turn. That's what repentance is all about. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I can't sit around and say why Esau's repentance wasn't received. But I would say it had a lot to do with there was a lot of tears and maybe not much turning. And repentance is more than tears. Listen, I don't know who I'm preaching to and I don't know why God gave me this message, but I just have a feeling it's for somebody. That if you're not careful and if you don't start place, placing value on what God's given you, you could miss an opportunity. And after you've missed your opportunity, you can go back and you might cry and shed a lot of tears. That does not mean you're ever going to get another opportunity. You better make the most out of what God's given you right now. 
You better take every bit of it. You better suck it up. You better like, absorb it like a spoon. You better place value on it. You better say hurt's not worth losing it. Pain's not worth losing it. Bitterness is not worth losing it. People are not worth losing it. These fleshly desires that I'm trying to fulfill in my life are not worth losing it. I'm going to place value on it. Are you with me today? I'm going to place value on it so I don't miss the opportunity. Esau is the epitome of a man that had everything to lose and lost it. It was his. It was his destiny. That's, that, that's, I think that's the point that's so strong in my spirit. It was his destiny. It was his. If he would have just put value on it, it couldn't have lost it. Because it was his. If he would have simply regarded it with a higher esteem, it would have been the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But because everything else was so important in his life, he missed it. And the promise was boarded in his life. And he saw where he made his mistake later on, but he could do nothing about it. Huh. What a terrible place to be in life when you look back at opportunities that you've missed and can't do anything about it. The best thing to do is make the most of the opportunities on this side of it. So that you don't have to look back at opportunities you missed. But you can look back and say, there was an opportunity that God gave me, and I made the best of it. I made the best of it. I put everything into it. I valued it more than life itself. And God took me to another level with it. 